Cool, so welcome to the final session of Interact Virtual Festival 2020. Um, I'm going to keep my intro very short as both Richard and Dan need no introduction, um, but needless to say, uh, the five kinds of innovation is a session we are really looking forward to here at Nomensa. Um, please join in with the discussion and ask any questions using the Q&A or the chat box. Um, please say hello to each other there too. Um, so yeah, without further ado, um, I'll hand over to Dan Klein and Richard Sol Werman. Henry, thank you. Uh, and hello, uh, Interact London audience. Um, the last time that I, I was uh, at this event, let me show you what it looked like, uh, if I might. Uh, this is what it looked like from the uh, stage at the uh, British Museum. But here we all are in our homes. Uh, Richard is joining us today from his home in Golden Beach, Florida. I'm at my office, my empty office here in Grand Rapids, Michigan. And when uh, the folks at Nemensa asked me, Richard, uh, if I wanted to speak at this event, I really didn't want to. And so uh, what I thought about was what this audience might, might want to hear instead of what I've told them uh, repeatedly. I've been a repeat guest at this conference. And I think what they'd like to hear about is your theory of innovation. So. Uh, my job here is just to uh, invite you to tell them about that, and then I'm going to use the chat window here to field questions. Uh, if there are already good questions, uh, often, as you've said, there are only speeches and bad questions, but uh, I will do my best. So, so what do you think, Richard? Uh, can you? I don't know why you got, how come you got the choice of saying no? I didn't get a choice of saying no. I was actually asked by you and with a, with a shading of guilt on it that I should do it because you did it and enjoyed it. Therefore, I should do it and enjoy it. So, but you could say no, but you're here anyway. Here I so am. I could you are. purposely talk very little and you would have to fill up the vacuum. Okay. I can do it. <laughs> Behind you is a little sign and we weren't going to, we talked yesterday how we were going to start out a little bit. We didn't prepare much, but I'll tell you, uh, since I'm calling, uh, talking from America, I'll tell you an American story of, of um, flying into London and then uh, getting into the, into the city and coming out on the sidewalk and, uh, and, and, and I looked the wrong way, obviously, because of the obvious uh, that if somebody got it backwards when when the car industry was begun in the United States. Of course, that's an erroneous statement. We all know that. But you guys drive on one side of the street that we say, oh, they drive on the wrong side of the street. And you come here and you say we drive on the wrong side of the street. Uh, that's sort of like people who play Monopoly around the world. There's 70 different sets on different cities and everybody thinks theirs is the original monopoly. Uh, you always look at things only through your own eyes, which I'll get back to later that we can only know what we know ourselves. And it's, it's, a, it's an illusion that I think I know what anybody in this audience is thinking or what Dan is speaking, thinking. And, and, and Dan and I talk twice a week at least uh, uh, for several years or maybe a year or two, we've talked at least twice a week for a couple hours each. And, uh, well, and it's I don't know. interesting that we can complete each other's sentences, but we can't know what each other is thinking. That is, for, that's a good point. Uh, <laughs> it's all an illusion. So it's terribly interesting to know what you're thinking yourself and what's in your head. So I, I came out of out onto the street, looked the wrong way, and I was uh, I was almost hit by a bus, and the bus came to a screeching stop. And uh, as it came to a stop, uh, it was uh, smashed into its rear by a little uh, Volkswagen, a little Beetle. And uh, the bus was uh, is about the size of a blue whale. Blue whale, about 114 feet, largest. Uh, uh, animal, not the largest plant or the not, not the largest living thing as we know, 
there's all kinds of plants that stretch over hundreds of square miles. But, um, and there's some relationship of trees where so they're now thinking one tree is really part of a, a, a huger group of trees. Uh, d different ways of telling size. But in the animal kingdom, which we're mostly defined, uh, we have edges to our, to, to, to every creature. Uh, uh, except ants and bees, which I'll talk about later. Um, so I was uh, almost hit by this bus, which is almost the size of the of a blue whale, and the and the bus was hit uh, by this Volkswagen Beetle, which is the size of a blue whale's a blue whale's heart. Um, The the, the 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 Beetle was was designed as the people's car, and uh, was done by Hitler, and uh, and was uh, done in 1935, the same year that the other part of the Axis in the in the in the Second World War in Japan, Toyota built their little car. I don't know if they were talking to each other or not. But they were still both these small, uh, uh, stamped-out cars that were to be the people's car were both built in 19, uh, 1935, and uh, they were friends in the Second World War. In the First World War, Japan, strangely enough, was on the side of the Allies and was actually in in uh, in Versailles on the train where they then moved out of the train where they signed the treaty, but they met on the train and a train uh, tr uh, car in, in Versailles. And they were shunted to the side because they were not Caucasians, uh, but they were part of the allies. And they were, that was part, that was the beginning of, uh, already existed, but it was really quite a snub that was given to the Japanese at that time. Uh, anyway, 1935 was the year I was born, and I'm 85 years old. Um, now, why is that story, why did I tell that story? Because I told you a lot of unrelated facts. Uh, I mean, they were related, but unrelated. They weren't an answer to any question. But by telling you that story, uh, it is likely that tonight, if you talk to somebody, unless it's already night there, uh, tomorrow morning, you will probably remember that story. And you remember the facts in that story. And you remember it because it was embedded in a story. And your memory is really critical part of this little chat this morning. The other day on the phone, one of these many phone calls ad nauseum that I have with, with, uh, with Dan, uh, I saw in front of, in front of me uh, the word, the two words that look the same almost and were different. When I say I see in front of me, I see people's speeches and when people talk, I am listening to you, but I'm also seeing them go across like I was on Times Square or Piccadilly or someplace where they have those signs where words move along. The Ginza. Um, I don't quite know why I do that, but I sort of taught myself to try to extend my listening, to, uh, to work on my listening uh, more than my writing. Um, and uh, more than taking notes. And since I have no skill sets whatsoever, uh, and I've realized that the only way forward for me was to embrace the fact that I was the dumbest person in the room and work at that, and therefore work at listening well, and by listening, making connections and seeing patterns and pattern connections. So it had to do with listening and seeing. 
So when I see the, I saw these two words, I said, shit, they're almost the same, and yet they're revolutionarily different. Now, when we talk about difference and opposites, we're going to talk about that one in a minute when we talk about uh, when we talk about uh, this innovation uh, little piece in the speech. Nothing I do can I prove. Nothing I say can I prove. I, I, scientifically or otherwise. There is a certain proof by use of a way I came out and Oh, 50 years ago, 40 years ago, whatever it is, Dan can tell you, uh, because I don't remember, but it was late seventies, I think, when I came out with uh, something called Latch, which I was writing a book called Information Anxiety. And I came to a chapter that I wanted to write. When I say write, I mean dictate and transcribe because I can't type. Uh, I thought, my preconception was there's an infinite number of ways of organizing things. How do I handle this chapter? Uh, now I have great comfort with terror. And so I was terrified uh, of how I was gonna write this chapter. And so I wrote down a few ways to organize things. And I couldn't, after I got to the fifth way, I couldn't think of a sixth. And so I asked somebody, you know, what are some other ways? And as I talked, it seemed to be there was only five ways of organizing information. And uh, somebody got my book and, uh, and the book w went over big at that time. It was sort of a prescient book. It oh, did. I don't wanna, no, I, 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 what I'm not gonna do is hawk, I'm not hawking books. First of all, you can't get it because it's out of print. So just- but You don't want me to do the, uh, the travelogue, the show and tell as you uh, talk about stuff? Oh, no, that's, unless you get off doing it, don't do it. Okay, well, I kind of do, but I'll, I'll, I'll restrain myself. Please continue. Okay. But it was 1989 when Information Anxiety. 89, 79, 89. And it was a big international bestseller translated into multiple languages. It was a big Yeah, deal. yeah, yeah. Yep. Um, and uh, somebody said the, the five words that I had, if you rearrange them and change one, they didn't tell me what to change. Uh, but if you rearrange them, they almost spell, come close to spell latch. And I thought, oh, that's terrific. Uh, so that's when I came up with this theory of latch, uh, that there was only five ways of organizing things. And I looked around and it seemed that in various kind of big subjects, there was, uh, it helped you begin working on things if you had a, a list that was limited as long as you knew it wasn't scientific and somebody could come up with a sixth or a seventh or a fiftieth but at least it began the conversation well in a long period of time nobody's come up with a sixth that was valid and uh, so it's people now think it's true uh it works for me and apparently it works for other people and passion is did big fat books organized on Richard Saul Werman's theory of latch. But somebody will think of another theory sometime and they'll certainly forget that I did that. And if it works, it'll be accepted until it's not. So nothing is that important. But I saw these two words and they were memorize and memory. Or you could look at them fast and they look like the same word. And then I realized that memorize and memory were what I have been talking about for 20 years in my rants about what we call the educational system or the learning system. And the educational system is memorize. In simple form, simple, you will find only minor problems with what I'm saying now. For most of us, over a long period of time, certainly the last 100 years, 150 years, longer than anybody in this room has, has been alive, uh, there was a certain group of things you studied, most of them you weren't interested in. You memorized certain aspects of them, historical dates, places, times, your, the tables of your arithmetic, uh, rules about grammar, rules about 
diagramming a fucking sentence. I mean, who wants, who does that? I think I'll get up this morning and diagram what I'm going to say. And diagram, I still don't know the difference between an adjective and an adverb. And I've really made it through, you know, pee 20 times a day and have, you know, breakfast and dinner. It's okay, you know, it just don't need more. Anyway, so we've memorized things we're not interested in. We throw them up, bulimically, we put them on a piece of paper or whatever we put them on now. And it's called a test. And then we're graded and the, the test is in some ways that makes it easier for the teacher to grade because they certainly don't want to read anything. And, uh, and then you forget it. Yeah. And that cycle begins again. So I think, you know, uh, Sumerian history, I never quite understood the Tigris of Euphrates Valley. Never quite understood where that went and what cities were on it. But we had a, it seemed like six weeks talking about the Tigris, Tigris and Euphrates Valley when I was in fifth grade or so. And the different parts of a glacier. Uh, uh, I guess it's, a, I mean, it's not bad knowing that, but it's only good knowing it if you're interested in it. And if you're interested in it, you remember it. You, you actually don't have to do well in the class. But if you're interested in, you know, terminal moraines and glaciers and the very, and glaciation and the, and the, the retreat and the, and the boulders and where the glaciers came down to, and, you, and you're interested in that, you remember it like I do, because I'm interested in glaciers. I do not believe most of the classes was interested in glaciers and have, in my experience, when I start talking about glaciers, there's, and I've taken no courses in glaciers since, and that was in fifth or sixth grade. Uh, nobody knows what the fuck I'm talking about. <laughs> so we have this word memorized. Yeah. When what we want is memory. This is, I don't mean to be really ugly about this, but when you have no memory, when you have either dementia or Alzheimer's and you have no memory. You can in some ways say that that person doesn't exist. What is their existence? I mean, they are physically there and you might love their physical presence. So I'm not trying to be ugly about this, no, but in a certain way they don't thing. exist. Yeah. Where did their person go? Yes. Without the those memory memories, their person isn't there anymore. You're six foot something or whatever, and I'm a, a short little gnome. And uh, what we are is five foot seven or six foot one of memory. Because when that memory's gone, we're gone. And that's the, the, uh, the crushing uh, depression of being with somebody who has no memory, is that they're there and they're not there. And that conflict is terrible. So learning, which is fundamentally what we want to do, is remembering what we're interested in. Yep. If we're interested in cars, we remember lots of things about cars, even though we don't take a course in them, don't get marked in them. And yet cars are, are involved with knowing street systems and the history of transportation and speed and materials and chemistry and design and color and cars names and models and the history of cars and the history of transportation when it comes to trains and wagons and the fact that the wheels are five foot eight and a half inches apart and they're the same way in wagons and the same way as our train tracks and it all comes from two horses in chariots in ancient rome five foot eight and a half inches we we can t take cars something that we're not taught and connect it to chemistry to the way we swallow and that whole form of peristaltic action going down our throat and pushing along the food, also in our bowels out our ass, is the same as, as, as we can learn in physics. Yep. And it's the whole physics thing that you can, you can do calculations on. And yet it's biological. And when well, we I talk of animals being the size, when I talked about a whale being very big, a colony of ants with the queen ant, if you watch uh, Star Trek, The New Generation, one of the most disturbing and most interesting 
time when they had two or three programs that continued, which was seldom new, usually were unique in themselves, were the programs on the board. And um, either you know what I'm talking about or you don't. But if you know the board, <laughs> E.O. Wilson, who is today considered the most preeminent, at least in the English speaking world, I believe, most preeminent biologist in the world. He's way up there. He's, well, he's just a few years older, I guess, than I am. <laughs> yeah, I was about to say, be careful. Yeah, I always keep on thinking of these people as he's old. He's an old people. guy. He's an old guy, you know. <laughs> it, it is, it, I really do think that way. I see somebody younger than me, but I always thought them as an old guy. Um, <laughs> anyway, at one of my meetings, uh, my one called Intellectual Jazz, just before he was finished his conversation, uh, with uh, Greg Venter, the person who first sequenced the human genome, they were finishing up this little impromptu conversation. And he said, oh, I, lovely, I'll announce something here for the first time because I just conclusively proved it last night. And that the queen ant and all the worker ants actually are one creature. That's the same as the Borg. Um, you can look up the Borg after this. Uh, and then that, then he walked off the stage, he didn't explain it any further. But that's also a very big creature if it's a single creature being that. Now we know that plant life extends sometimes for miles, whether it's kelp or it's uh, fungus or other things under the ground. And certain trees apparently connect their root systems and stay away from each other up on top of the canopy because they know each other. All new stuff. We're learning That's some. One of my favorite words, Richard, crown shyness. When the crown. crowns of the trees That's right. don't touch. Crown shyness, right. Yeah, it's like, no. Nah. <laughs> uh, and the canopy, nobody, I, when I grew up, people didn't use the word canopy. It's just new ways of looking at things. And the can I lived in the jungle of Guatemala for six months once. And I certainly was very much aware of the canopy because the jungle, it was very, very hot and the sun was always out, but you never saw it. And you never saw it because of the canopy. It makes it fairly gloomy <laughs> in the jungle because it just about touches each other up, up high, you know. So I was driving into uh, San Francisco. Uh, I mean, I wasn't driving, I was in a cab. Uh, probably about eight or nine years ago. And for some reason, there was a series of three big billboards that said San Francisco, uh, America's city of innovation or innovation city, San Francisco done by the chamber. And then Honda was advertising something. They had put on a car, a camera in the back of the car. So when you back up, you can see who you run over. And, um, and that was innovation in transportation somehow. And um, there was another innovation sign. And, um, and we think, we think uh, the Tesla uh, uh, is innovation. Actually, it isn't. It's just another nice looking car. And it's really just, it's, I said to Dan uh, a couple weeks ago, and it's, it's really sort of funny. Uh, I have to learn how to explain it better. But I said, there's only one company in the United States or in the world. And um, it makes Band-Aids. He knew instantly what I meant. But you have to really explain it. Is that all we're doing is doing different Band-Aids to fix some problems. <laughs> we're not innovating. The Tesla did not innovate uh, transportation. It's another car. It's a nice car, but it's just another car yeah. uh, that's nicer than a, but I mean, I would rather have a Duesenberg uh, that wasn't sufficient. And the fact that it can go zero to 60 in just a few seconds is worthless. It's a meaningless lead line in an ad about a car. I don't shop cars by how fast I can get to 60. I have a, I actually have a British car. Um, and for the second time, huh? 
for the second um, time. Actually, yeah, a couple of British cars, yeah. And, and, and the booklet in my car says it can go 206 miles an hour. The area that I live in- What's the fastest makes, you've taken it? Uh, probably 70. Once. Uh, <laughs> the area that I live in, this little town called Golden Beach, a serious part of their income comes from people driving 26 miles an hour because the speed limit is 25 and they give tickets. They literally give tickets for 26 miles an hour. It's a little town, 800 people. You can't buy a newspaper. You can't buy a bottle of milk, no commercial whatsoever. Have its own little police force own garbage collection and gardeners. And you can't drive. And if I go outside of this little area, I can go 35. Uh, I'm never going to go fast enough in this car where the zoopy design of it, the airflow of it, the testing it in an air in one of those wind chambers has any meaning at all. It just does not affect my fuel consumption. I mean, it, that wind tunnel design really affects how a plane flies mm -hmm. because over 80, over 80 miles an hour, it's, you have to really overcome things. But it's certainly when a boat has these zoopy windows that they always have in Italian yachts, you know, that they have to cut out these little pieces of the moon and make it look when it's standing still in port like it's going 50 miles an hour, it doesn't go more than 12 knots or 50. And nobody goes that fast a yacht anyway. But it's design looking, it's meaningless innovation, meaningless design. Most things are not innovative. So I realized, let's see, what, how many ways can you innovate? So here I have my iPhone. I'm not advertising for Apple. I guess I can turn it around. So, um, <laughs> It certainly is an innovative product, but it's innovation by addition. I ought to get the real number, but I bet you there's at least a hundred different inventions in there that are integrated together, but the inventions all by different people, all with different patents, all thought up differently. It's innovation by addition. It is really an amazing addition of different ideas, completely different ideas that were always separated. The camera was different than recording and recording was different than this was different than that, than memory things than this, the glass, the design, all of them. And they added them together in a very clever way and then miniaturized in there. So A, that's A of a nose. Now I'll go rapidly. N is need. Uh, o is my favorite, and we've already talked about that a little bit, is thinking the opposite way. It's often the opposite of what you're thinking is the breakthrough. In science, Jonas Salk, who you name who you don't know, who was the most famous person in the world for about four years, because he came up with the Salk vaccine and basically uh, got rid of uh, polio in the world. His, his big innovation was not spending for all that time coming up with the vaccine. And we're in the middle of a vaccine time now, but of making a dead vaccine. So we should watch when the COVID vaccines come out, which ones are dead and which ones are alive. If the alive one is cheaper to make and comes from a country that wants to flock it out or can produce it fast, we'll always have, and it'll, we'll never make that die out because it'll always be in somebody's feces the live vaccine will stay in our systems. It's a dead vaccine. You can wipe out a disease. It's harder to do. It's more expensive to do, but let's see what they do. But it's a very simple thing. It's the opposite. I was talking to Jonas. He was a friend. And uh, I was at that time doing a speech and a book on the failure. And he says, that's pretty boring. He called me Ricky. It's pretty boring, Ricky. He says, all science is is you fail and you fail and you fail and you fail and then something works. All my life is failure. 95% of my life is failure until I see something that works, that I do something 
that, that it works. I yeah, wonder, I've never heard you say that. Success and sex and sex. Like, I've never well, heard you say that before, and it makes me wonder if Jonas heard Lou say, because I've heard a saying of Lou Kahn about working on whatever you're working on and the appropriate solution, that you hate it and you hate it and you hate it and you hate it, and then... Same thing. Yeah. There's some wonderful, there's some wonderful um, movies, some silent movies of Picasso painting for an hour, big, a big painting. I've seen two of them. I am intrigued with them. They're amazing. Clumsily made, but nice, really nice. I think they're on YouTube. And he put some stroke on a painting, and his whole the whole hour is recognizing the failure of what he's doing and correcting it, correcting it until he can't correct it anymore, and the painting's finished. It's failure, 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 and then all of a sudden it works. Uh, so we're at O, right? So we have A, N, O. Then we're at N, which is need. Much innovation comes from need. Uh, I, I hardly have to go in that because that's so obvious. Like the polo vaccine. We needed it. We needed it. And then there's S, which is subtraction. So uh, I've done some some um, gatherings in, in, uh, in my life, different times, some different gatherings. And one of my major approaches to the gathering was subtraction. I took away the lectern. I took away the long talk. I took a, I took away uh, saving seats in the front of the room. Not a small thing because it stops the idea when you come in of them and us. Took away saving seats, even for the speakers. Made everybody kind of come in. The speakers should get as much out of the conference as anybody. Gave away, took away press passes. I don't. I never had, never tried to have the press there. Think of what the press, everybody wants press. Everybody wants press for a conference that they do yearly. If an article comes out on it after the conference, it does you no good for the next year. It's a year away. It's just a way of, of, of it's, it's ego satisfied. And I don't care what the press says. And if I give them a free seat and, I'm, and I can sell out anything I do, I just lost a few thousand dollars. I was about to say, I think when the case of Ted, especially, uh, those were seats you could have sold. Why are you going to give them to the oh, press? So I never gave press passes, yeah. Yeah. which was the opposite of what people did. I, every, there was not different ways of going through the conference to give freedom to pick the road through the conference of this speciality in this room meeting. I wanted everybody to see everything. So they, during the one hour protected break, Everybody had the same memory. And they it's one of the great about things about this event when it's in person is that it's a single track and everybody sees the same thing. And there's well, nice the, long breaks the multiple, with each other. Yep. The multiple tracks were done for this false, phony, young notion of freedom <laughs> that you give people all this choice. No, you should have happy limitations. You, and everybody should be able to talk to each other. Yeah. So what are we up to? We're up to S. Uh, and then we get E, which is this very fuzzy definition of mine. And I added E on because I realized nothing fit into it. There's some things that just don't fit into the regular ways of innovation. There's some things that certain people that are different than maybe you or I or Maybe I've even done it sometimes. I just have what I call an epiphany. I think of something that doesn't come from anywhere and I see a pattern of convergence or a pattern of something that I didn't learn from anybody or it didn't seem to come out of somebody else's work. It probably did, but I didn't know it. And other people invent little are working with uh, glue and paper and they don't realize they're angry because the glue doesn't stick, doesn't work very well, but they put some on the back of a little square piece of paper and it's a post-it note. And there wasn't a post-it note. Before there was a post-it note, there wasn't a post-it note. No, there was just and a shitty pad of paper that didn't right. work right. So, yeah. And post-it notes became, you know, a billion dollar business probably for 3M. And there's other things that come up that people think of that are just an epiphany. The, the, the 
uh, I knew Land and Land, a, a Polaroid camera. And Land said there was no market for it. Nobody asked them for it. Nobody wanted it. And they, when they got it, they couldn't think of a world without it. <laughs> At one point, it was one point. It was really part of our our lives, uh, taking a, a an instant picture. Yeah, and and what he was trying to do was instant movies, right? Not in, yes, not. Yes. Not one. That didn't, work, that didn't work at all. Yeah. And, but he thought people would want that. But both of those inventions from nowhere led to the fact that people wanted it. They, they, they found a market of people really wanting to have uh, very quickly a record of themselves and others. Yeah. And that gave rise eventually, not making the Polaroid camera better, or or the 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 instant movies better, but it got packed into this invention this invention by addition of our iPhone, and now we take billions and billions of pictures we'll never look at, and we make little movies we'll never see, but we get rid of that desire to of immortality that dies when the electricity runs out on our or the charge runs out of our little thing but we it's some need that we then feel we we had and got answered by an epiphany by somebody some brilliant people person well it seems like these five things if they're a family they're fairly <laughs> incestuous and that any one of those innovations starts to rub up against some of the other ones and there's a question from the audience about how to use uh, memory and memorize as a designer, if there's a way to operationalize that kind of thinking. But before we get to that question, I'm curious about, um, and I'll, this, is a, this is one of those uh, speeches and bad questions. Uh, this is a speech. Uh, I use latch the same way that I use a nose. Once you know location, alphabet, time, category, and hierarchy, then you don't have a cold start problem. Then if you're trying to get unstuck in what you're trying to do, you can run through those little ways and all of a sudden everything changes and you can start to see different patterns. And similarly with a nose, you can't say, okay, today I'm going to use epiphany. I'm going to force an epiphany. <laughs> but, but you can frame a conversation with your team to say, we're expected to innovate. What are we doing? Are we, is this an addition thing? Is this a subtraction thing? Could we pull an opposite? In my house, we say pull a Ricky. Uh, if you do something opposite, you do a Richard Saul Werman. You, you, you do the opposite. Print. Just so, so I don't think you're saying that these are the only five ways to innovate. Just like you never said, those were the only five ways to organize information. What I've benefited from is just having a place to start and, and running through those and knowing what you're doing when you're doing it. Understanding how you understand and uh, explaining to yourself well, how you explain. I am not a preacher. Those things seem to work, though. Yes. It is helpful. And it's helpful to designers. And How about the memory I, memorize thing when it comes to uh, what, what a designer is going to do with that? Do you? Well, let me, let me go back to what we talked about last night, which I said I was going to chat about to begin with. Okay. Uh, and it's something I'm going I'm really digging back into my past. And I did a long time ago, I said that change only occurs with the perception or the actuality of catastrophe. Yeah. Well, that seems a little depressing, but it's, fa it's fairly true. Unless there's something uh, catastrophic, something that really isn't working, uh, uh, or you perceive that it is a catastrophe. It might not be one, but you perceive it as such. It is that corny phrase, the mother of invention, <laughs> that um, in order to defend wars, uh, people have written stories of all the things that got invented in the Second World War because of the war that have now helped and served society in a great way. Uh, and they make a case, well, the atomic bombs brought us atomic energy, which many people think is a very good source of energy. 
people think it's a great source of disaster. Yeah. But that's only one of many things. There's many things that were brought by the intensity of the need of, to, to work out a catastrophe. Yeah. Well, we're at a cat catastrophic moment now. Uh, we perceive it as a catastrophic year. We, people are joking about that this is maybe one of the worst years ever. 537, they say, was the worst year ever, but this might be the worst year, certainly in our memories, because uh, so many things. Uh, there's new fires today in Colorado that my son, Josh, just wrote he's going to the fires. And uh, he's been to the last three hurricanes and then the fires before the hurricanes. My son obviously chases uh, catastrophes. So I was going to say, I knew he goes into water and wind. I didn't know he goes into fire also. That's... You know, hail, hail, and fires. He's doing a lot of firestorms now. And uh, he's in your Guinness Book of World Records uh, for measuring the fastest wind speed on Earth, uh, 318 miles an hour in one tornado. He has these trucks with the big Doppler radar. But this is not about my son. Uh, it's a, the, the catastrophe that he's trying to answer is also allowing him to invent new, he has a whole bunch of new kind, new uh, patents on different kinds of radar to measure things that are catastrophic. And the catastrophe and the need brought about uh, new, new invention. So we're at a time now that a lot of people are, are staying home from school and learning at home. Nobody knows how to learn at home, so they model it on learning it the way they would do it at school. I mean, that's their model still. There's no other model uh, except the friendliness at home and maybe conversation at home that they couldn't have at school. Nobody has come out with a wonderful program that could help people attach themselves to a pattern of learning uh, which is pleasant, which is interesting at home. No, we, we hear about children crying into the Zoom window. They're trying to shove school through a rectangle on the screen. I, I, so the, the obvious hasn't happened. It's that lemon and lemonade thing that uh, uh, somebody wanted to do a conference. They did, in fact. They said, what should I call my conference? I said, call it lemon. What do you mean call it lemon? I said, when your car doesn't work, you get a bad car, you call it a lemon, right? But we are at a moment of, in the world's history that's a lemon turning into lemonade. What would you do with this lemon to turn it into lemonade? What would you do with the fact you can't go to schools that have been broken for 50 years? Clearly, everybody hates school. They hate the list of things they're taking. They hate the teachers. They look who's teaching us. I know there's teachers in the audience that hate me now. Uh, they think that the solution to the problem is pay teachers more money. Why does that have to make a better teacher paying them more money? We, we think if the school classroom is smaller, it's better. Kids hate to be, love to have kids. It's not, it's not, that's not a magic solution to it. And then they hate taking most of their courses that they're not interested in. And nothing comes from them of what they want to learn and they don't have guides. Get rid of the teachers and call them guides and have a guide like the way Oxford and Cambridge is set up where you, you take some classes, but you also have these moments, an hour a week or two hours a week with a student where you can talk about anything as part of your education, a guide to what you're interested in, right? I talked it's with one of your students from Cambridge who talked about that very thing, how pleasant it was to be punting on the cam with your teacher and telling your teacher conversationally while some other student is uh, pushing you around what questions you had that week. What did you... What well, did not any questions, but I asked them because the question, a good question is better than a brilliant answer, that I asked somebody who would, you know, knew Cambridge and knew England quite well, would he tell me about some of the plant life here that I didn't recognize? And, and the amazement of the crocus coming up at springtime there and, and about the fens and about things. And then when, as he told me, I would critique how he told, how he spoke. 
In other words, where did he begin his story? How did he make it go into me? What was the pattern he, he was creating to make it interesting to me? How do you tell a story about a building, about a design, about an event, about something? That, that he was giving people. you information about architecture and what you wanted was an architecture of information. Exactly. Yes. And uh, <laughs> anyway, so we have a moment here yeah. and we have a moment where 10 to 15 percent after this, the COVID thing uh, finds another way of, of living with it between a vaccine and better treatment, which probably will happen. I think they have a plan to happen for my birthday on March 26th. And uh, that will be the big announcement. Anyway, uh, we will have courage to come to endure some other ways of learning. We will have the ability to realize that learning is remembering what you're interested in and that every interest connects. Anything you're interested in, I can spend 10 minutes with you and show that it connects to any subject, to physics, chemistry, to biology, botany, to any, because we're all connected. All the things we know are connected. Yeah. Ted was the convergence of tech, the technology business, the entertainment industry, and the design professions. Nobody had had a conference that had people in different disciplines. Architecture had their there are their big AIA conferences, local AIA conferences, and all kinds of architecture conferences that architects went to. And they dressed up in suits and they sat on panels. And they tried to have those conferences someplace that had a golf course nearby. Medical people had all the specialists, brain specialists went to one conference and skin specialists to another and pediatrics to another. They even had not only medical conferences and doctors only there, they had special specials there. They didn't talk to each other. And well, yet good than... work got done. It was bringing the entertainment industry, the design professions. You know, well, and it was even worse than that. Uh, Stuart Brand, when I asked him about that and about Ted, he said that East Coast and West Coast within any one of those particular fields there was then a divide between the East Coast of the United States and the West Coast in and, how they talked about right. it. And, so, and Ted brought the both coasts together. Yeah. So that doesn't seem like much of anything, but that change in pattern uh, really made something that was prophetic. Probably would have happened if I didn't do it, would have happened just later. Because it's inevitable that these people would real would, somebody had to realize they were working with other people. And at that time in the eighties, the beginning of the eighties, the projects that started to be terrific in entertainment and in technology and in design, they each needed each other, yeah. but they never went to the dinner together. And so this was the dinner party that I always wanted to have, but couldn't. And now I could. And so Ted was a dinner party and there was no safe seats. And uh, there was long breaks and you got, and everybody attended everything and it wasn't too big. And uh, I just accepted the first, at first, the first 500 people then the first thousand people that wrote in because I doubled it. Uh, I doubled it by using a huge conference room connected to the auditorium. Uh, not connected, below the auditorium. And when I ran out of tickets for the auditorium, I said, if you want to come, you can come, but you're going to be watching it on huge TV screens. Uh, and you're going to pay the same. And if you don't want to come, don't. Uh, <laughs> Then people found a new reality of just being there because they all came together for the breaks. And when there was room in the auditorium, some people rather be in the auditorium and talk, be able to talk to the person next to them without bothering somebody because you couldn't talk to somebody in the auditorium. And they like to put deals together and talk together while a program was going on. 
So, and that's a perfectly, without guilt, they could go to a conference and talk because everybody has a has guilt when they have to get up and go make a phone call or yep. they want to talk to somebody. So, well, especially, you know, that's another one of the rationale for the multi-track conference is to allow people to not be there so they can take a call. You found a way to keep your audience together, but for those people who had to work or, or, or do something during the conference, they could still listen. And they could cherry pick what they wanted to see if they, it was just human. I just, the, the very simple, I don't like to talk about Ted, as you know, but yep. I'm asked about that. So I'll just say, I'll give you the secret. When you want to do a gathering, make it a gathering you would like to be at. Whatever that is. Yep. One speaker, a thousand speakers, a big room, a small room, a lot of people, few people. Just do it so you would like to go. And all your judgments of what you want to eat, where you want to sit, how long the things take, how long the breaks are, whether you invite people, whether it's expensive, whether it's cheap, it's in a big room, it's in a good city, a bad city, a captive audience, a non-captive audience, whatever it is, make it like you would like to be there. And that's how you design it. There's no other silver bullet. This was the meeting I wanted to have. It was a totally indulgent experience. <laughs> and indulgence is not a bad word because indulgence is a truthful word. Because if anybody knows what you like, it's you, not somebody else. And if you purely do the things that you want to do in your design, you understand it and some other people will too. Which, which relates directly to a question that just came in, which is that. I don't like the question already. I don't like the question. I don't like the person. They should go home. <laughs> well, uh, tough because they're here and they've got a, they've got a question. Damn it. And it, it's about a word in our field, uh, and I'm using not you and me, Richard, but uh, digital designers, information architects who work on digital products and services, let's say. Uh, there's a big word in our field called empathy. And so this person, Manny Manny, wants to know about empathy and how big of a role does empathy play in innovation? Do you feel like this change in direction toward it so, so they're saying our field is, 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 is really pointed toward empathy. Is that a positive thing? Are there downsides to trying to innovate through empathy, whatever empathy is? <laughs> uh, I mean, for me, it starts with what you said earlier about how we can complete each other's sentences. We know each other well, but we never know what's in each other's head. So how could I empathize? How could I feel what you feel? I, I think it's a valid question. I don't think I, I'm, I, I'm the right person to answer it. Uh, to me, uh, I said before the things that I deeply are deeply meaningful to me are I'm, I'm not so special. And so I think there's other people feel some of the things I feel. I don't know who they are, but you somehow, over a period of time in your life, you're with people that have some of the same reactions and feelings to things, and also the same questioning of things. Uh, I don't think I can design that. It would be like uh, designing the color of my hair. I mean, I can't design that. Uh, but it's, that's a personality characteristic. And, uh, what, what uh, some people have said, I'm abrasively charming. And you know, there's some people think I'm abrasive, but, but being abrasive sometimes can be confused with, I tell the truth and the truth can seem abrasive. If I go up to you and I say, you have a booger hanging out of your nose, you could be shocked and you say, how can you do that so impolite? Well, it is and it isn't. It's, it's the truth. 
it might help your day for me to tell you you have a booger hanging out of your nose and get it out of there uh, so that people, when they come up to you, aren't listening. To, if you have a booger in your nose, nobody's going to listen to anything you say. I don't care if you're King Tut, right? <laughs> so, so what is that? Is that being abrasive? Is it being rude? Is it being truthful? Is it actually being empathetic and helping that person through their next conversation? All of those are true. Yeah. I know. Now, see, I took a radical thing to say to shock you into that truth. <laughs> it's not an easy question to answer. Uh, I, if there was somebody I wanted to hear speak, I didn't try to, I didn't, one of my criteria was not to look for great speakers. I looked for people who I wanted to understand what they were working on. And I accept perfectly well the clumsiness of somebody speaking if they have something to say. Now, is that being empathetic? Is that being empathetic to somebody who wouldn't ever get the chance to speak because they're not a good speaker? And yet they have something to say? Or do I get somebody who's the person who's in who does the business book with the 12 little dots and do these six things and gets paid $40,000 a speech because they're a great, give it a great 35 minute speech. Yep. And, 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 uh, I know and, and, I'm pulling out the word empathy, uh, but there's lots of meaning to empathy. Uh, well, there are some people, what... some people are not empathetic at all. They, they, we know, uh, I mean, we have a president of the United States that obviously uh, is uh, conspicuous in his lack of empathy for any uh, living plant or creature. Well, and of, even of how we define it. Yeah, and even what empathy means in my own research, I found uh, a German who defined it earlier than anyone as the ability to relate to inanimate objects which reminds me of something I've seen you do, you do, which is before you do a book, you've got piles and you are sitting amid the piles and you, you, what you say is they are going to tell you what they want, how they want to come together. Well, and, and so is that a kind of empathy asking brick what it wants, asking your piles of information, how they want to come together? It's a little woo woo and a little zenny and all yeah. that kind of stuff. Yeah. And it, it gets you, sometimes you fool yourself and talk yourself into some mystical being, and sometimes it's habit. And sometimes if you give a name for it, it disappears. So I don't know what that is. Yeah. Do uh, people have different ways of beginning? Yeah. And, uh, and when Lou Kahn said, I, I, I asked a brick what it wants to be, and it said I wanted to be an arch. And he got lots of publicity because that was so queer. What an odd thing to do. And I asked a piece of steel what it wants to be. Well, we really did that ourselves anyway. We were trying to think of the existence will of something. Yeah. You know, what shape does something want to bend into? What, what does, where, how, does, how does paper act and how does you know, steel rods act? And we early I'll on. Do, I'll do this to you. Does a access guide with a radius corner, did it tell you that it wanted to have a radius corner because it needs to go in and out of somebody's bag? Did you no, empathize it, with the. It's just that the corners of books always get bent and it kept fresh and new that way and it was too expensive to do. <laughs> so it's a nicer way to do a book to have that corner, but you have to. So far, when I was doing that years ago, they might have a better way that you could only do a few books at a time. You put it in and it cut off the corner, put it in and cut off the corner. It was labor intensive. Yeah, but uh, as an example of empathizing with the end user, why that radius? It's to Because I liked it. Yeah. See, I have a, the end user was me. Yeah. I did, I did a book on San Francisco because I didn't know about San Francisco. It was a, this is an important thing, I think. I don't know who's in this audience. 
There's 20, 20, 29 people. Well, they're, they're all trying to get expert in something so they can sell their expertise. Yeah. I mean, our society is set up, your parents, they want you to be a doctor or a lawyer. They want you to sell your expertise. They want you to do something really well, whether it's play the cello or add numbers. They want you to do something well, and then you can go out and sell your expertise. If you start a, a restaurant, they want it to be the best restaurant in, in, uh, in uh, Welsh cooking or something. And then you go to the publisher and you say, I have the most successful restaurant that serves genuine Welsh food and I want to do a, I want to do a cookbook on it. And the publisher says, well, that's interesting. I know it's successful. People talk about it. It's in the papers. I'll give you an advance because you're selling me your expertise in Welsh cooking. I go through this town, I go to the restaurant and I say, geez, this food is good. I go to the same publisher and I say, I don't know how they do that. It's amazing and it's really different than anything I've had. I'd like to learn about it. I'd like you to give me an advance so I can learn about it and do a book on Welsh cooking. Of course, he turns me out the door because I'm selling my ignorance. Now, my contention is my book would be better. Yep. Not because I did it. It's because I did it out of my ignorance and the book would be going from not knowing to knowing. And that's the journey you want to have when you read a book. Yes. And I would go not from my preconceptions, but in trying to understand something. Now that is a radically different idea then I believe everybody in the audience has because they're trying to work on their expertise and sell that in their interview, in their essay, in their work. They want to show their expertise. They don't want to be the dumbest person in the room. Well, as you often say, half of our audience is below average. But there is one person who in the chat here said that they enjoy trying to be an expert in not knowing so they can help people deal with uncertainty, which well, I think I is, a, which is a terrific way to talk about information architecture. Yeah, 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 absolutely. And you have to put yourself, when I start a project, I sit and I, I, I have learned, this is natural, I learned to be really dumb and vacuous. I learned to be stupid. So that I can learn, so I can look at the problem and then see what the problem is before the problem that was given me. Before the program, there is another program. Because the program already is a preconception. A program is telling you the problem they want to have solved when it might be that problem has something that caused it. Yeah. Now, yeah. Which, which, going, which... going backwards. Which really speaks to uh, our host, Simon Norris. Uh, he, he, he observed that going from not knowing to knowing is a brilliant idea and wondered aloud for us, how do you cultivate that? And you, you, you answered it already. At least one of the answers is it has to do with the direction, which is to go backward from the problem statement, from how the problem shows up, which, which connects for me to memory and memorize that the, the looking back is a uh, way to get, counterintuitively, it's a way to, to, to move forward. In one or two, of, I forget which book you probably know, either 33 or Understanding Understanding, I think the beginning of the book or something starts with a chapter called Before Before. Yes, that's uh, in Understanding Understanding. Okay, it's probably in 33 someplace. Because I think, or maybe that book has after, after. <laughs> I'll look it up. I won't do it live. It doesn't make any difference. It's, it's really this weird, it's, you know, kind of a woo-woo thing of there's things before and after we think we've started a project or finished a project. Well, that was one of the, one of the encouraging, I find a lot of encouragement in the work of your teacher, Lou Kahn. And one of the things that I found so encouraging was his statement that uh, 
that you could be a brilliant architect, even if you're a shitty designer, that there's a way of working. If you could come up with a, a different way of, as you've said, uh, going to zero, going backward from the problem, that you wouldn't even have to know how to do the how. That there's there's yeah, a job was, for there's yeah, a job yeah. for people to be good at the what, and you might not even be good at the how. Yeah, they have no skill sets except thinking. Yeah, except clarity and making the complex clear. Yep. Yeah, I, 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 in a sense, I have no skill sets, but well, I get I get shit done. Well, I. I wonder if, if, if Simon has found uh, an answer to that uh, statement. I don't, just... I don't know this Simon. Do I know this Simon person? I was going to hook you up with him uh, in a Brunel. Uh... Oh, he's the person from Bristol. Yes. Yes. Okay. You were going to have a Brunel time with him and, and maybe. Okay. Someday... Well, I, I did. Oops. Yeah. No. But anyway, you saying that you don't have skill sets, that, that's kind of cute. Simon is, is saying, is Richard talking about play? And it strikes me that that is a skill set that you have that you can't deny, is that you're good at playing. You're good at playing with the, uh, the variables of the problem. Let's take it through location. Alpha, we, can look at that, we could look at that word playing as one thing, like work is joy that the Quakers said. You could also say that I never grew up. Yeah. With all the, at, all the things that are around growing up. Uh, we could say that most of my life I, I was quite unsuccessful and then the world caught up. Uh, we, you could say all kinds of things, but I didn't change. I, friends from grammar school told me that I was the same as I was in kindergarten. So I never grew up. Well, that's not an attribute in our society. You're supposed to mature. And maybe I didn't mature. Or maybe they did, or maybe I did do what you're supposed to, that yeah. worked and they did something that didn't work. I don't know. I, I, I know that <laughs> the, the, the key is to have interesting days. And if every day is interesting and every day is different, then it's another form of boredom because every day is the same. Yeah. <laughs> so if you say, well, every day is the same, you say, oh, that must be terrible. No, because every day is interesting. <laughs> but every day is the same. Yeah. It, it's, it's I think, you, I think you proved Simon's point. It's play. You, you, are, you are playing with your day, with your schedule, with the elements of a problem. Well, what I've been doing, focused on, I did it already for an hour this morning. I do play with kindergarten play. And I've been doing a whole series of serious bronzes and I just finished one this morning. Uh, so that's kindergarten play, Kinder, you know, that plasticine. Yep. And I guess it's playing. It's certainly not serious work. I don't sell them. I don't show them. I don't yeah. have a, I don't make money from them. It's not my livelihood. Uh, they cost me a great deal of money to <laughs> cast in bronze. Uh, and I, love being by myself doing it it's a beautiful so are you playing you're playing with yourself <laughs> uh well that's, that's other meaning to it that i don't want to get into uh one last question uh and then uh we'll let our uh our guests uh uh leave catechism for for the day um joshua robinson says Everyone, and I think he's talking about, again, our field of, of user experience design, everyone is trying to do futuring. Consultants bottle and sell it, and companies like McKinsey sell the problem and the solution, thus benefiting from everyone believing in their version of the future. Is there any worth in this practice of futuring? I've never been asked that question. Um... You're writing this book on me and you have said to me in various times, well, you're the first person that ever said this, that happened. And obviously I know that there's some things in my books that I didn't think I was predicting anything. It turned out I was. Yeah. I was saying what I, I wasn't saying, this is the future. I was observing what I observed some patterns. You're pointing at your truth about a pattern. 
and then yeah. other people agreed. And then, and then it turned out that that's what happened. Okay. Yep. I mean, in a sense, convergence happened very quickly after TED. Yep. And, and then gatherings changed because of the way I, I, if a, a, a jerk that didn't go to, was, didn't have a job, uh, wasn't on any faculty, didn't work for a company, wasn't had just welcome. been kicked off a board. Uh, is what? You had just been kicked off a board. I had just been kicked off a board. I've been fired from a, from a deanship that I was terrible. If I could, if I could figure, have a, do a conference by myself with no money, no sponsors to begin with, then I guess anybody can. And people were sitting around with their paws up waiting for somebody to ask them to do something. And I've never had that either luxury or that patience. So what I think I've done 30, 40 conferences. I've done almost 100 books, whatever I've done. But, and I don't have a publisher. I don't have a PR person. I don't have a distributor. Nobody's ever asked me to do a conference. Uh, everything I've done, we say, people say, oh, that is so great. You're, you're, you don't have clients. That's wonderful. Oh, yeah, it's really wonderful. It's also shitty. Yeah, nobody I feel, wants you. I, nobody wants me. I don't feel wanted. What is the one thing you want to do? You want to feel wanted. So you ask me to talk, and I feel a little wanted. That feels good. I feel a little wanted. Yeah. I'm not getting paid for this, but I'm enjoying you're just it. Sitting in the train station in the department of waiting to be wanted with your little feet. Waiting to be wanted, waiting which is on the my seat. table, right? <laughs> I'm constantly in the, I'm constantly in that thing. I'm waiting to be wanted, and maybe someday I'll be wanted. Oh, Richard, we want you uh, as long as you're willing to be with us. Uh, thank you for doing this today. I am uh, delighted to share you with my friends, uh, Simon, Henry, uh, all of you at Nomensa, everyone in Great Britain. Uh, Thank you for giving us this opportunity to be with you today. Well, this thing that we're trying to put together now is the first thing I've really been wanted for. <laughs> well, no, thank and you. it's a secret. <laughs> thank you both so much. Um, I mean, what an amazing way to end an amazing week of incredible talks, panels, conversations, everything else in between. Um, yeah, I'd like to say a huge thanks to everyone involved this week, speakers, panelists, sponsors, everyone who watched the sessions uh, will be... Um, sending links to all the recordings. You can give them my email if they want to um, send me something. rsw at worman.com. Awesome. Uh, awesome. Thank you. Well, yeah, we can, yeah, Dan, we can, we can distribute all of that. Um, I'd like to say a huge thanks to everyone uh, involved in making this happen. Um, special thanks to Catherine, Nancy, Liam, Lauren, and Simon here at Nementsa. Um And also, uh, we're not done quite yet. Um, next week we're launching a second week of virtual events in lieu of Interact London sister event Interact Amsterdam um, and that's going to be taking place 16th to 20th of November. Um, so block out your diaries and look for news on that that will be dropping next week. Um, and yeah we'll leave you all there. Um, as here in the UK it's about time to go to the pub I think. Um, so thank you and see you all next time. Uh, well, thank you and one last thing. Uh... I have too many copies of Understanding Understanding. It's a good problem to have. So I pasted a link in the chat. Uh, getting a copy of a seven pound book to the United Kingdom takes about 60 US dollars. So for the cost of shipping, if anybody wants uh, a copy of Understanding Understanding, a brand new copy, I took on a whole bunch of them about a year ago, thinking that 2020 would be a year where I would go in person and have these books to give to people and uh, that hasn't happened. So uh, if anyone would like this book at only the cost. I don't want to burst your bubble, but I think Amazon has some, and it might be even cheaper than $60 to get it from Amazon in, in <laughs> right online in England. So they ought to check that out. We're not flogging the book. I don't know. We are not flogging the book. This is just to help you. Uh, okay, we don't I'm not, I don't get a penny from anything that occurs that we just said. I just want to make that clear because yep. I've made it very strong that I don't flog books. That yeah. book was never reviewed, although there's a bunch of reviews. If you go on Amazon, if you go, if you go all the way down, understanding, understanding Worman to the bottom, there's seven or eight ethereal reviews, better reviews that I didn't send out for reviews and got better reviews than I've ever gotten on anything. So people like the book, but it might be cheaper to get it with it. It's a $75 book, but they discount and they might deliver. So it might be cheaper 
or you can get it from Dan, but it is, it is costly to mail. Yeah. Awesome. Well, we can, yeah, we can, we can email out um, all those details. Um, yeah, ours are on a pile in a, in, on a loading dock in uh, New England. So uh, if you'd like one, we can get you one. Wicked. Thank you so much, Dan. Thank you so much, Richard. Um, and yeah, see you soon. Thanks, everybody.